Now, despite what it might have sounded like in the previous talk, by 2010, my life wasn't just about sex. <laughs> Um, in fact, it wasn't even about sex at all. It was really about the void inside of me, the hole that was unfulfilled, the lack of any kind of spiritual awareness. Um, a relationship that was not based on unconditional love. It was very conditional. It was very much in the ego. It was who's right, who's guilty. It was about judgment. It was about always holding each other guilty, let's say. Attack. Trying to change each other. But really, even in the middle of all this, my life wasn't really about that, was it? I mean, my life, if I think about this whole story, it was really about trying to find happiness, trying to find truth trying to find beauty, trying to find meaning. Um, you know, I could have stayed in my, in my hometown. I could have gotten a, a job in my, in my town and saved some money and bought a house. I could have gone to college, but then done the same after college. But I was always, I guess, ever since I had that, that dream at 12 years old, about basketball, it was always this idea that there's something out there, there's something better, there's something to chase, there's experiences to be had, places to be seen, people to know, things to learn, things to achieve, things to create. And for better or worse, that's what my life, that's the story of my life. And it doesn't come without challenges, it doesn't come without ups and downs. And a lot of times those ups and downs are happening at the same time. <laughs> maybe all maybe all the time that's how it is. Can you can you enjoy the good, the beauty, the goodness, the reality of life while there's also something dark underneath it, while there's also some problem on the horizon? That that's really for, for me that's really where I've been able to find happiness when I've been able to have perspective about what really matters, what's real. Now, since, you know, since we moved to Europe, I mean, it, obviously you can imagine it's, it was a um, wild experience. It was like, I was pinching myself. Like what, where am I? I, I hadn't talked about this in these talks, but ever since we, Eva and I were together, there was this, this vague notion that we'd spend time in Europe together that I always dreamed of, having a job in Europe, you know, I even, I remember even wrote to like US, US Steel, who has a, a plant in, in, in Slovakia, like, is there some job ridiculous, you know, to try to find a job that way? Um, I guess, you know, you have to just do it and you have to figure out how to survive. And that's what we did. We just threw ourselves into the fire and we thrived. From 2005, you know, my time with Eva, and following Ellie's birth, you know, we had we had some amazing times. We spent a month in Barcelona in 2007, in the summer. We had an amazing apartment right downtown Barcelona, went to the beach every day, and, and then worked in the evening, and then went out after work, because in Barcelona, people are, are up all night. Dinner is at 11 p.m., and so we would just be up all night and one time up until the sunrise and then slept and went to the beach and did the whole thing again. And that was how we spent the month. Just as the stock market in 2007 was crumbling, and we lost $35,000 in our investments at the same time. Um, we spent a month in Cannes, France, you know, and, and renting a flat as well by the beach. We played Patang and learned kind of, kind of enjoyed the French culture. Um... We took many vacations to to Greece, to Crete, to Turkey, beautiful, all-inclusive hotels. We went to amazing, there's beautiful hotels in Slovakia, beautiful wellness hotels with, with saunas like you can't imagine and, and pools and you're in the mountains and we skied all the time. We had a beautiful home. We Our life was abundant. You know, we had we even had a family life. We would visit Eva's parents and and have some wonderful food that they'd prepare and 
And um, Eva's sister was always a very good friend of mine. And we, we, we always intended to have a child, probably just one, we, we thought. She, Eva did want a child. I forgot to mention that in the, in the previous talk. And I did too, but always later. And at some point, you know, you, you're, you're, you're fearful of having children when you're young, when you're in your 20s, when you're not ready, you're scared, like, geez, it's going to change everything, right? And, and one day you wake up or, or you're laying in bed and you're thinking about your life and you're thinking, oh my God, what if I never have a child? So for me, my motivation was, what if I never have a child? That would be tragic. And despite all my reservations about the world, the fact that I, I knew about the corruption in the world, I had no faith in the system. I knew, I knew, by this point, the whole healthcare system was was there to to um, make us sick and, and kill us. That you know the economy was exploiting us. That the food industry was there to make us sick and kill us. That basically the whole world is against us. The banking system is rigged, uh, printing money out of nowhere. Down the list, I understood all the corruption, all the evils, even in Slovakia, um, even though life in Slovakia is easier to raise a family. You have, you know, healthcare paid for, school paid for by the government, uh, high taxes, but you can, there's ways around that. You can always find, find strategies to lower your taxes. There's, every restaurant has a play center for children. I mean, it's a really child-friendly, family-friendly place with conservative values in the villages and small towns. And, so here we are, 34 years old, and even though I'm living this wild adventure in my private secret life and living this amazing adventure, traveling and laughing and having amazing food and partying with my wife. I mean, we would go, you know, almost every weekend, I guess we'd get a, we, we would we would go out, you know, we'd go to the clubs, we'd have a dinner, then we'd go to have some drinks, um, stay up as late as we could. And we had a lot of amazing wild nights out, laughing, drinking, partying, which is kind of unusual, I guess, for a couple who's been together for 12 years or 13, 14 years. Um, we would sit on the balcony, that beautiful balcony with a view of the cathedral and, and our, you know, and just have some wine and, and talk about whatever. So it was good times, despite the fact that I had a whole in my soul that was unfulfilled for whatever reason. And some people do drugs, some people do do whatever, you know, bad habits they do. And mine was seducing women. Um, but I loved Eva. I wanted it to work. I wanted to be understood, to be accepted. And I wanted to have a child. I, I For years, I had imagined, for some reason, I had this fantasy that I'd have a a Pisces girl. I don't know why. And after one attempt to get Eva pregnant, when we were talking about having children, but she didn't say it like let's let's go. Um, that was the one attempt that got my Pisces girl Isabella in 2010 when she was born. And I love her 100% unconditionally then, always, and to this day. And I would even say that that I see myself as a pretty good father, which probably draws some laughter on your part. But I know the truth of, the, of, of what's in my heart and what, what I've been for Isabella, how I've been there for her. And I was absolutely overjoyed to have my wife pregnant everything, we were still on the rise. I mean, Chad and Eva were, were just like up and up and up. And I don't want to overshadow that stuff with, with, with this somehow shameful, guilty stories of what, of, of my secret world. I mean, um, the truth was in the reality, the truth was in 99% of my time, what was I doing? I was there as a husband. I was there. I was holding down a, a, a good job. You know, I was traveling for work occasionally. I was doing good work, selling myself for a sales job. I could have done better. I was, I was distracted. 
there was drama. And there were still women even during all this time, secretly. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into specific stories of the drama because, because that's not, it's almost like I'd be proud of it if I, if I had done that because I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of the shamefulness of being caught in a lie. I'm not proud of the fact that Eva started using um, our iPhone tracking technology to, to watch where I was going all the time. Where I would have to leave my phone and forget and pretend to forget that I my phone to be able to go somewhere and be free for an hour. And and all that contributed to this feeling of of, of like even though I, I was committed to doing the work of being a parent and a husband and and paying the mortgage and 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 doing everything that life requires. I still felt that I was going to fill that hole that I felt with other people, if that's what it took. And I thought I could have it all. I thought I could protect Eva's feelings. I could have my needs fulfilled. And no one's ever going to find out, even though it already had happened a few times. This time, no one's going to find out. And, and that's how life went on for many, for many more years. Uh, Isabella was born with a C-section because of some health conditions of Eva. And we almost lost her. We almost lost Isabella. She, her heart valve wasn't working properly. Her breathing wasn't, was, she was not in taking oxygen. She was down to like 60% of oxygen when she was first born. They had to take her to a different hospital, put her in an incubator and put a tube down her throat for a month. She was in the hospital, her very first month of life. It was hell. We could see the hospital from our balcony and we'd visit every day when we were allowed to. And it was just the darkest time. And then one day, they took the tube out and she was breathing. And then a few days later, she was ready to go home. And a beautiful little Isabella was... A change, a change my life to have a child. Um, I love those moments, even though there was a lot of shaming that I wasn't doing the right thing. I wasn't with her enough. I wasn't playing enough. I wasn't doing this. It's got to be equal. You know, that was the thing. Well, it's not really equal when you have a baby because mother, the mother, you know, there's a certain role for the mother, especially, you know, breastfeeding, although Eva didn't breastfeed because, because of the first month, um, not being able to. Um, but you know, the, the waking up at night, we did split it. I'd get up. She would get up. We would both take care of her, both change diapers. Um, at some point, um, I guess during, during the pregnancy, actually, this is not important. I'm just telling you some background, just what's going on in my life. Um, I had that band. I told you before that son got up Skanda with Kevin and we, we had a drummer and a guitarist and we had some concerts and it was a sloppy band. Uh, we didn't practice that, that often, like once a week, but we did some shows and had some fun. And one, and the thing is Kevin, Kevin was a, a singer songwriter as well as I. So we tried to, to do a band where you have two lead singers, basically. He had more songs than I did, but I still wanted my, you know, 30, 40% of the songs. And I told him that. And he basically one day just decided that I was going to be thrown out of the band. Okay, no big deal. Really, it wasn't a big deal. Um, of course, I was resentful and I lost, and we lost our friendship over it. And I didn't really understand why it was necessary. I was already paying for a lot of stuff that he couldn't pay for, you know. Um, so his, his band crumbled, obviously, without my financial support. And I went on and I, and I kept writing some songs and I recorded some pretty lousy songs to be honest great songs but i didn't have the skills to really do a solo recording with ableton and i didn't you know have the focus and time to really do that i had already recorded a solo album before that called midnight snow abscondo midnight snow um which actually went kind of to the top of this independent site i had like actually hundreds of thousands of, of listens and and actual fans and and some of the songs being actually played in um in stores in europe and publicly so it wasn't it wasn't a, a failure by any means but it was a nice indie side fun project that i you know successful it was it was really interesting and so i kept i kept writing songs and i, I loved 
my music. I just loved writing songs and I, and it, it just felt so beautiful, such a beautiful thing to do. And it was fulfilling for me very much. And, but I realized that, that you know, uh, to keep recording on my own at home, there's kind of a limit to that. And I, I wanted more, you know, my, my never ending drive for, for more success and the ascension and, and my ego gratification, really the grandiosity of the whole thing. I'm going to start a band and it's going to be the best band in Slovakia. So here I am with a two year old at home. Um, and I'm going to start a band at age 36. <laughs> Okay. And Eva was supportive. She probably thought like, hey, at least it's a it's a healthy hobby. <laughs> and um, so it took, it took a little while. It took a few months to find the right people, to find good enough talent. I didn't know anybody where I could just, you know, give a call and say, let's start a band together. I didn't have any, much of a history of, of live mu music. And um, I'm sure they were skeptical about whether I was good enough to, to you know for their for their attention for their time and attention but eventually we put together an amazing band really top level musicians we called it abscondo and we practiced for a few months we had a jam room it was kind of a heavy metal uh like a really old building with a bunch of other heavy metal bands um renting rooms so we when we played our sort of softer music we heard thrash metal kind of going on all around us, and it was it was a little bit you know, not ideal. Um, but we practiced for those for like a few months, and finally had our first gig at some university um, party, outdoor party. And you know, we, I made my mistakes. I was off key a lot of times, and and uh, but but they're good songs, and people thought it was interesting and different singing you know English songs and original English songs in Slovakia by an American. It was kind of a different thing. And in that first year, we had some success. I mean, I felt like it was pretty amazing. We we had um, the very first year, we had gigs like at outdoor festivals in Slovakia. We had a reality TV show that, that I went on, a cooking show. And... and um, my Slavic language was and is still pretty darn basic, and I make a lot of mistakes with the language, but I can kind of function and communicate. So I went for a week long uh, thing where I, every day you have you have a dinner party, and you you know you, you have your night that you cook, and, and you have your party, and then you have you go to other people's parties, and and you rate who did better and and so forth. And so you know I I actually won the week. I actually beat some. They had me on with some Slavic kind of B level celebrities. And and I I won the, the the show and I went home with my thousand euros reward, and um, the band got to perform on on live TV after my after my uh, on, you know on my night of presenting, and after that show aired and a few weeks later, I had a little minor moment of being famous. <laughs> um, something like a third of Slovaks when I would walk by they would point and they would talk so like you know the third of the idiots watching TV basically. Um, and it went to my head. And it's really funny and embarrassing. It actually went to my head. I think anybody who, who has their moment of fame, uh, even how, how pathetic, it's only in a small country of 5 million people. And it doesn't mean anything. But I became obsessed with who knows me in this room? Hmm, who's looking at me? Who, who knows who I am? <laughs> who I am. And it was kind of fun to walk into a restaurant and have people whispering and pointing or on the street. But unfortunately, it only lasted for about three weeks and people's memory, memories are very short. Um, and after that, nobody really knew who I was again. Um, the thing about having a band, well, in general, I guess, is that if you're going to have electric guitars and a drum set and everything else, like a proper band, it's really expensive because you have to have a big enough van to carry four or five people and all your instruments. You have to have a sound guy. I didn't know that or before I started the band. You have to have a guy that, that actually listens to the sound and does the mix. And so that's expensive. So you have to so your concerts have to pay something. But 
if no one knows who you are, how do you get paid the 500 euros minimum to be able to, to do this and, and to pay everybody a little bit of something at the end of the day? So at first you say, well, we'll just tour for free and just get fans. Okay, so now who's paying for it? Well, I was paying for it, right? So um, whenever you, you're the one paying for stuff, you would think you'd get respect from the people around you. But in reality, what I found is that when you're the one paying for stuff, nobody respects you. It's just kind of like a law of nature. So the band didn't respect me. Um, it was like they were friends, but I was an outsider. And they were, and I felt like I was being used. Um, even though we had a live concert on the radio in, in one of the fam most famous buildings in Slovakia where the, radios, the, the radio and TV building in Bratislava, even though we had this TV thing, even though we had festivals that we were doing, um, we didn't have songs on the radio, so it wasn't a it wasn't a total success at, by, by any means. But you know, we had local concerts that people actually showed up and knew who we were. Um, we we traveled to uh, around the country, and that's not easy because I talked about that five hundred euro expense for a concert. But now if you stay in a hotel, imagine that price. So you can't stay in a hotel. So what you do if you have a concert five hours away and you're an up-and-coming band is you rent your van, you get everybody together, you pack the van, you drive all the way there. So you're leaving first thing in the morning. You do your sound check. You wait. You wait. <laughs> you finally have your concert. You're already exhausted. You're trying to get your energy up and try to do a performance that people will like and not make any mistakes. And then you have to unpack everything. You're tired, sweaty. And now you drive home all night. And you literally arrive in the morning. So, at, at, you know, with a baby at home at age 36, 37, 38, that wasn't quite as appealing as I thought when I thought of starting a band. But I did it. I kept going. I was grateful to have a concert. I had a job. I had a baby. I had a wife. I had to practice. The, the fact of the matter is I wasn't writing new songs anymore. They were using songs I had already written. I wasn't practicing quite enough. Um, because how could I find time and energy for all that and, and to maintain a job? Um, wow. <laughs> and that went on for about four years we had the the abscondo band for about four years we we went to the studio we, I, again i paid for it <laughs> um if you want to hear some of the music we made as a band i think the best well the only thing you can really listen to that gives an accurate perception of it is the album victory in a landlocked sea it's everywhere you find music it's on you know apple music and wherever else you download spotify Look for Abscondo, Victory, and that whole album is the band recording in the studio. And that took a long time to make. And we are all very proud of what we created. It's, it's, it's an amazing album. Those are all songs that I wrote. But the band, you know, especially a guy called uh, Philip Klugnowski was kind of the one who, who, did the, who really decided about the mix and the music. I think it got a little bit too complex too many sounds too much electronics and i think we tried to use a lot of that in our performances after we had recorded we had some playback and i think people were turned off i think they liked our band when we were more simple just four guys or five guys with a piano um just playing live and people loved it and i think something happened when we started to get too too much playback and also i just was getting a huge ego in general in life i was just a massive ego um it's not attractive, you know, on anybody. When you think you're great, when you think you should be famous and you're so interesting and you're so attractive, right? You're so good looking. You have, it's a really sick, it's a, it's a sickness to think that you're better than other people, that you should be famous. Look at me. Look at my amazing life. Look at my amazing songs. Now, the songs are beautiful. I do think that what makes the songs beautiful, I still I still play guitar all the time, and I play the, all these songs just privately to myself. And I think there's a lot of stuff in here that is beyond the ego, that is 
beautiful. And I'll get back to music, I guess, as we go. But yeah, music has always been a very big part of my life ever since I picked up the first guitar. First you start, you know, strumming, then you start to actually play a song and sing, and then you learn a few more songs, and then someday you write your own songs, and then the next step is, well, now what? Well, I could record a song. Oh my gosh, I could perform a song live. And there's something really special and amazing and fun about getting up on a stage and playing your song that you wrote. It's an amazing thing. I hope I get to do it again someday in some form. But all this while, there was that underlying thing. You know, there were relationships. There were people that that I had, that I wrote to, that I maintained deep relationships with um, secretly to fill that hole. I don't really understand it now except to say that, that, that there was a hole, that um, it wasn't about sex. It was about the, the depth of that kind of relationship, that unconditional, 100% honest, unconditional love sort of relationship with people. Now, I was also starting to understand that women don't just go into relationships for fun. So... Even though I was being honest that I'm not looking for any kind of partner to replace my wife, ever. I'm ne never leaving her. I, I was always honest about that. Then I would go on and reveal myself and the depth of my soul to this person. And, of course, in, in some cases where there was some kind of compatibility, where, where she felt the same emptiness in her life, where her parents didn't, didn't get her, her, her other boyfriends didn't get her, or your friends didn't get her. And and we, we connected on that level that nobody is understood. Nobody has the freedom to express, you know, the truth, the true story of their of who they are, of what they feel. Um, it's a very sacred thing to do with someone. And the sex was more just about about making sure there's no bar there's no barrier, there's no boundaries. It was about crossing every boundary with a person. Because when you do that, then there's no, there's no, you, there's nowhere to hold back. There's nothing inappropriate to be said, or like it's, it's like it was so inappropriate at, at the core that you created this sort of freedom, and it felt like freedom in those times together, and it felt like freedom when you're writing a long email or chatting. Of course, it wasn't freedom. It was you know we were slaves to this thing because in my case we talked about that. Um, we talked about the damage it does to, to my reality, how it, how it sort of overshadows, it makes reality not reality. And, and the worst thing is when you're, when you're cheating and lying, there are times that, you know, ideally you never have to confront anything, right? Just don't mention it, right? But the reality is that there are times when your wife is like, where were you? Are you cheating on me? Tell, look in my eyes. Tell me, are you cheating on me? And you look back and what are you going to do? You're going to look in the eyes and you're going to lie. You don't recover. A relationship doesn't recover from that unless something fundamentally changes. And, and like I said, she was, you know, and on, on the side of the women, I think the problem with this, this kind of thing is that, is that they can't talk about it also. They can't tell their friends. They can't tell their mom. They, they can't tell they can't tell their boyfriend or their future partner someday about what about this relationship and that does damage to people whenever you do something that can't be talked about openly or you feel that it can't be talked about openly you, you won't be accepted you'll be judged for it and you feel you're, you'll be judged for it it does damage to people so even though you're you have this moment of, of pure bliss these moments of pure bliss and freedom and connection that it's hard, honestly, looking back, it's hard to say that I, that I regret doing it because, it because it's that amazing in the moment. And it's an ex one of these experiences. And I think that life is all about learning, learning what things are and what they aren't. And that's why we're here. 
That's why, that's why the soul has been brought into the, this world, to go through these experiences so that consciousness can learn from the good and bad and hopefully grow and figure it out. At this point, I had not figured it out yet. Um, and as I said, it was getting more and more difficult to, to find space. Eva was tracking me with the phone and everything else. There was no trust anymore. So and a few more times I tried again to, to say, look, this is who I am. This is what I need. I want to be totally loving and honest and open about everything. And I want you to accept me. I want to be with you forever. I'll never leave you. I'm never going to fall in love and leave you. And I meant it. I meant every word, always. I never crossed my mind that that's anything, any other story never crossed my mind. And this went on for, God, almost 10 years. And then I met, and then I met in 2000, in, this, in January 2014, I met Susanna. And she was just one more girl like the others. I met all these girls online, most of them. And I didn't take her seriously. She was 24. I was, at this point, I don't know, 38, 39. So ridiculous age difference. She was in college still. But when we wrote, it was, it was a connection that I had never, it was just so nice. She totally got me. She totally understood me 100%. My, even my story, my truth. And she was the most beautiful, or most attractive lover of, of the other of the ones I've had. In fact, you know, all the years, I guess, I was fantasizing about women when I was back in college or, you know, the early years. I was fantasizing about exactly her. And... We had some some wild times. Um, we would, because <laughs> I had my jam room, I had my excuse of practicing music. We would rent hotel rooms <laughs> um, during the day and meet up whenever we could. And of course, we'd write emails and chat. And I didn't really think that it was any different from some of the other people I've been with. It's just, it was so nice. She was so nice and it was so easy. And, and we just knew that we were never going to be together. We agreed like a hundred percent. We're never, she's like, I don't want to be with someone with a kid. My parents would never accept me. They would never accept this relationship. You're, you're 15 years, 14, 15 years older. And you have a child and you're married. And my parents are very, conservative and they're not like those kinds of people that would accept that and I was like okay so there's no chance there's no future for us whatsoever let's just be friends let's have fun you're in college as soon as you meet somebody you know we we, we end this but until then let's be friends and let's have fun and we tried to break it off I had I got caught again I had one crazy concert where there was other girlfriends that showed up and Susanna was there and everything and I was in my ego 100% and I think one of the, one of the bandmates saw things and told my wife and here we go again I got thrown out I had to stay in in a hotel and guess who and guess who came to to, to comfort me and be with me Susanna Now I was in no shape to be to be starting a new relationship with someone and we both agreed that that's not what's going to happen. I'm in no state. I'm not the kind of person. I didn't work on myself. There's no way that I'm going to jump from this marriage and, and into a relationship with someone in college. You know, I know that she wanted children someday, of course, like any good woman. I didn't want more children with somebody else, a second life to start over with somebody else. That was my worst nightmare. That's, that's the one thing I never wanted. I wanted to be with Eva. I wanted Eva to, to love me as who I am. Because if you don't love who I am, what do you love? You love 
all the ways that I obey you, that I'm scared of you, whether it comes to our vacations, whether it comes to how I play with my child or how often I play with my child or what I say to my child or what I say to you or what I do right or wrong in life in general. You love me when I do things right according to you. You hate me and abuse me when I do things wrong according to you. And on some level, this created this massive hole in me. I was so freaking lonely with her, even when we're talking. And she had so much resentment toward me in her eyes and her face, the way she looked, looked at me. She never forgave all the damage I did, and how could she? She wasn't that kind of person to forgive. So... Even though I keep promising and never do it again, I broke it off with Suzanne. I broke it off again. I went three, three, four months behaving perfectly and the hole and the emptiness and the loneliness starts creeping up again. And we're in a cycle. We're in a damn cycle that I don't think I'll, I'll, I would ever break out of. I didn't know what to do. My willpower wasn't big enough. Despite how amazing my external life was, despite how... Eva reminded me you have, that she's an amazing woman. Despite the fact that I'm living in her country, that she helped so much to get me here. You can't imagine how much Eva had to help me with a band to help schedule some concerts. I don't speak Slovak well enough to function perfectly. Right? I, I was dependent upon her. I was scared. I was terrified of losing Eva. Plus, we had a daughter together. I was completely madly in love with my little girl. I was, you know, all the all the amazing things you can imagine and having a child, reading stories at night, all the sweetness, all the tenderness, going to hotels together, teaching her to swim, throwing her in the pool, going to the park, pushing around a stroller, all the things that really matter in life, the most amazing loving moments with this little girl. The idea of losing access to her every single moment was unthinkable to me. So I was going to try again to find that willpower and cut it off and <clears throat> keep everything going. Just keep building this, this, this tower of, <laughs> of greatness to my ego. And at this point, by the way, on the business side, I had, I had, I was into Tim Ferriss four hour work week. I, I, I believed, I started believing that you could make money without having to work a regular job, that that was the way to go. And, and I had this idea for a service, not rather than having a job, let's have five or 10 jobs and run a service for companies to find new opportunities to, you know, to do, do the sales. And I had this process I came up with. I, I hired, I wanted to hire people in India to do, you know, the repetitive work. Where I, where I focus, you know, four or five, ten hours a week of my attention to get these campaigns going and, and get these opportunities, these meetings set up for my clients. And I had this really clear idea that I would charge $500 per meeting. And I was pretty excited about this, but I still had a, I still had a job. But I went on vacation to, to Croatia with Eva to a very fancy hotel. And when I came back, my boss calls me and says that I'm fired. I wasn't producing enough. They just didn't need me anymore for whatever reason. Uh, we're letting you go. And I, and I immediately knew like, okay, that's meant to be. I had this clear idea. So let's start this business. I already had a business, of course. I had, that's how I got paid all those years. But the mindset shift away from having a job to having a business that generates income um, without necessarily me having to, you know, hourly do the job, do the work. And so I was broke. I mean, I wasn't broke. I, I had savings, but I had no income. I had a new apartment that we bought, an expensive one. And in, in, in Slovakia, it was like 220,000. Plus, we spent another, you know, we spent altogether 300,000 euros. Uh, well, of course, there's a mortgage in there as well. Um, and we have a new car and a new place. And, you know, this is like, this is probably 2013 or so. And we were going, to, we were flying to Montana to a friend's wedding, <laughs> and I lost my job. And this is a very fancy, rich people wedding. And I come in there, what do I talk about? So I started talking about that I had this business, and that got me through that awkward situation. <laughs> 
But when I came back home from that trip, I didn't have a source of income and we're blowing money and bleeding money. And I learned uh, some discipline to really, I was up early. Whenever I couldn't sleep, I'd just get up and work, put together the presentations, the website, do the prospecting. And it took about four or five months of hard work before I had the first client. And that project failed, but I learned some things. I got the next client. You know, half of them failed, half of them were successful. At some point, I had a business that actually was making us enough money to live our lives, to keep everything going, the band. The problem is that some months it, it was much, some months I didn't make anything. I'm, I'm paying people in India to do the work. I have expenses, like you can't believe. I, 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 at some point, I had to bring in $10,000 every month, right, to pay for everything, to pay for my life and and the business expenses. I needed $10,000 of income every month. That was just how it was. And before that, I had a job that paid about 7000 And that was enough because I didn't have all the expenses. But at the same time, it wasn't really enough to have a band and have this life and have all these expenses. It wasn't enough with a wife that wanted to buy clothing and, and go on vacation and, and, and go to hotels. It wasn't enough money. We were, we were kind of losing money even when I had a job. But with this business... This info being business. Um, at times, I had five or ten customers. They'd pay five thousand or twenty five hundred for a pack of leads, and I'd go to work getting their meetings set up. And there were some months that I that I got paid thirty thousand uh, dollars. Some months I got paid twenty thousand dollars. Some months I got paid twelve thousand dollars, and some months I got paid zero, or two months in a row zero. So it was more drama, more roller coaster in my life. Eva, all the while saying that I'm crazy that it's not going to work that i'm not making enough money i would show her that we are i would show her that actually it is working and somehow i made this thing work and this this business went on for 10 years um even though it was not wildly successful by any means and actually losing money or i think overall i lost i not losing overall i didn't make enough to pay for my life expenses right so i lost savings from from it but I'll get to that later. So I had everything, a business, a band, a wife, a child, an expat who had had some success, a respectable life. And yet there was that hole inside, the spiritual hole. I had nothing to really believe in besides the grandiosity of myself. And I wasn't, I was happy. I was happy, but I wasn't fulfilled. God, I had everything, you know. I had every experience that I could ever possibly fantasize about. I mean, of course I wanted to be famous. Of course I wanted to be world, worldwide Coldplay famous. <laughs> there was no limit. I, didn't, I knew that wasn't going to happen at some point. But you, when you're starting a band and you're in, who knows? Um... The fact is, I didn't have any connections. I didn't have any reason. I'm nobody. I'm just a dude from Opaka, Wisconsin. I told you that in the beginning of the story. I'm still that same dude at this point. I'm not somebody who can call, uh, who has any connections to, to get your song on the radio. I, I, hired a P, I hired a PR agent. You know, I got in, in some magazines and she tried the best she could to get us positioned. She sent our, our demos to the radio stations. But this is a closed society of people, of insiders. In any country, there's a certain group of people, and I won't name them by name, you know who I'm talking about, who control things. And if you don't if you're not one of them, if you've not sold your soul to them, you're not gonna get on you're not going to succeed in the media, period. Um so let's get back skip ahead to the end of my marriage with Eva. So I, I had cut off Susanna and, and anybody else who was, I was still in contact with. And later that year, that hole starts creeping up again. And she writes me out of nowhere. She says, I still think about you and I like you and I want to be friends with you. Just friends, nothing else. And I was taking Isabella to preschool and I saw that message and I stopped the car. I mean, she, I, I had dropped her off already and, and driving back home. And I wrote back and I said, I want to be friends with you too. And I also want everything else we had. 
So here I go again, slipping down that that dark path. And we went again and did our fun and had our and grew as a friend, as a friendship and couple. And I still never came to terms with the fact that I that I was going to that I, that I might be with someone else or I might leave Eva. I didn't want to be with someone else. I wanted to be with Eva, but I wanted to have this friend. <laughs> And we we became so close, our connection became so close that I just wanted to be to be near Susanna. I wanted her like I want to see her every day. I wanted her in my life every day. And we had this ridiculous idea. I had this ridiculous idea to hire her as my band manager. <laughs> and um, so we, you know she would meet Eva. She would come into my apartment. She would come into the jam room. She'd she'd tra- travel with us to concert a few times, and she wasn't really qualified as a band manager. <laughs> and basically, after some time, every lie gets exposed. Everyone, every single one. If you think if there's a, a lie in your life, if you think people don't know or they're not going to know, they're going to find out. So whenever I found out about this one, who Susanna really was. I, I just was pushing it even further, you know, to bring her into my real real life. To have her in my home and, and meet my child and everything else and even babysit, to be honest. And I just crossed the line in a way that you really couldn't go back. So finally, I guess Eva sort of was, was you know, pushed into the corner to where she had to sort of except that I was polyamorous, that I had someone else, and I loved her still too. And we tried to make that work. She finally, I finally got my wish that she would try it. And, of course, it, because it was not her choice, because it was forced, it, it, it was never going to work. And what I found out later is at that time, Eva would, would go to Prague once in a while, let us be together. But what I found out later is that she had met her high school sweetheart, and was with him at the same time, which is fine. But she wasn't honest about it. I was honest about it. And she was lying to me now. And she had somebody else. And she would go to Prague and take Ellie. And he had, this guy had, has children. And, and they would hang out. And then I don't know the details. But I know that for sure she was seeing him. There's evidence of that. And that went on for, for some time. Until the fighting got to be too much. And I had nowhere to go to escape the fighting. So we agreed that I would get, we went to, we went to one last trip to America to visit my family. And by the way, we had gone like almost every year, more expense, like thousands and thousands of dollars to fly to Wisconsin and to rent a car and everything else. Just bleeding money. And, um, we went to Disney world with Ellie, with Isabella. <laughs> and we had a nice time. We went to the beach Went to Disney World, went to spend some time in Florida, rented a house. It was amazing. And we were happy. And on the way back, driving back from the airport, I said, you know, I still mean all the stuff that we're still both free. I love you. I want this to work like this. And I, one thing I want to change though, Eva, is I want to have a place that I can go. If we're fighting, I can sleep there. If, you know, so I'm not cornered to these violent fights or to work, to leave my apartment with a baby and actually go somewhere and work. So I wanted to get a really cheap apartment and it was pretty cheap back then and I, and I could afford it. And she agreed. She hated it because I guess she knew that once I had an apartment, I was, she would make me move out. I didn't know that. I was so naive. I thought that we were indestructible because of all we had been through and how well we function in the world, I thought at the time. And so we found an apartment. It was walking distance. It was very small, basic, like 600, 550 or 600 euros a month. And we signed it. We pretended that we were a couple moving in, but actually it was just for me. Kept it very basic, just the necessities there. 
And it wasn't probably a few days into, a few days later, we had one more fight and she threw me out. And I was, to be honest, this whole pattern of throwing me out, all the arguing, all the fighting, the yelling in front of a child, it was enough. We were just worn down. The ego of our relationship had collapsed. It, it didn't function. There were no good times anymore. There wasn't, there wasn't enough good to balance out the bad. She just hated me. And there's nothing I could really do or say anymore. She didn't believe that I could change. I didn't believe that I could change. She couldn't accept who I was. She hated me. She could never forgive me, ever, from the very first time. Ever since we were, we were 18 years old and I first had my first fantasy, it was like she never forgave me. So I, I was drinking heavily. In general, I do drink my fair share, and I always have. But during this time, like it was, I was really going through hell. And I agree with Zuzana that that we're not going to pretend that we're together. She's not going to come live with me. Of course, her parents knew nothing about our relationship. Of course, she lived with her parents in a village. And I needed time. I needed time to find out what it meant to be alone. And we're going to stay connected, but we'll only meet a few times a week, just like before. And she's going to let me be and figure out what I want in life. Is it? And, and I still want to go back to Eva. I was still fighting for Eva for a long time, even, even then. And so for a while, I would go back to Eva's every night, every afternoon to play with Ellie and put her to bed. And then try to talk to Eva and hang out on the couch and play music, have some drinks. And then 10 o'clock would come. Eva would suddenly find a pick a fight and pretend that I'm evil and threw me out. And I'd walk home. Even in the freezing cold in the middle of the winter, I'd walk back to my little apartment. It wasn't a short walk. It was like maybe a kilometer away. Not quite that. And I never understood, like, why can't I sleep over ever? Like, I'm your husband. And we're getting along all night. Everything's fine. And then he threw me out. Well, it was. I found out later it's because she had the boyfriend already and, and that was what she agreed to with him. So she was just confused like I was. She was playing him, playing me, not telling me the truth, having me around, didn't want to end our, our marriage either, really. But how can he, her boyfriend accept that she's going to sleep with me? So this went on for some time. Sometimes I just went home. Sometimes I stayed there and got, and got sent home. And I say home meaning my new my new place. And I would drink and I'd be lonely as hell. And and Susanna made it clear that, that I was still free, that I still needed, if I needed somebody to meet somebody else or whatever, or be with Eva, of course, it was fine always with, with Eva. So, you know, our relationship was built from the very beginning to be an open, an open relationship. I mean, you know, Susanna knew that I had a wife and she had to accept that, even if she did love me. And I knew that she was a young, beautiful woman who deserved her own life and that as soon as she meets someone or wants to break this off, I have to accept that. So we, we, we knew that was unconditional love, right? So whatever we have together, there's no conditions. There's no promises of, of tomorrow. There's only the promise that we will treat each other well and we will allow each other to be free and be, and be who we are. And that's why it felt so good. That's why it was so perfect between us. Um, so I, I met another girl, a friend of mine, that, of course, all I, you know, I never had been with this girl before. She, was, she had been a friend, and she came over to the apartment. And, of course, I tried to, tried to seduce her. And she took a deep breath and went outside and had a cigarette and came back inside. And she said, no. And I think you need to work on yourself. She told me, you need to find self love. And you can start by reading Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I wrote and I wrote it down. She finished her coffee and she left and I was alone and and just at the bottom at the rock bottom in life. And when you're at rock bottom in life and someone tells you to read a book, do it. 
because that's a sign from God. And so I downloaded not that book first. I downloaded a different, a more famous book of his called The Four Agreements. And what I found in reading Four Agreements, I won't summarize the book for you here. You can look it up. Is I found a sense of peace come over me. And then I, I went on to Mastery of Love. And I began to understand what love actually is. It's not that codependent relationship I had with Eva. It's not the possessiveness. It's not the seduction, the conquering people. It's not the fighting. It's not the ego. It's not the holding guilty. It's not all the stuff that everyone in the world thinks is love. And I felt an enormous sense of comfort. And what I also felt, well, what love is, is it comes from within. It doesn't come from a woman, or in the case of someone else, a man. It comes from within yourself. And when you, can, when you begin to find the ability to, to look within yourself and feel the love coming from within, turned on yourself... You know, it's a cliche, learn to love yourself. It sounds so cliche and stupid, right? But if you take it literally and learn the skills and learn what love actually is and what it's not, what ends up happening is that you don't need someone else to have love in your life. You realize that you are love. The, the truth about you is love. And yes, you have sinned, and by sin doesn't mean going to hell. Sin means that you've made a mistake. You've missed the mark. And the way you've missed the mark is you've not had love. You've gone off course. You've lied. You've deceived. You've gone off reality. But fundamentally, that life force within you is love. It's the same thing. It's also the same thing as God. And when you do the work, and it's not even work, it's enjoyable. Read these books. They're amazing you release all that ego, all that burden, all the misery, the guilt. And I remember one time I went with Susanna to, on a trip to, to Prague on a train and, and we got a hotel in Prague and I was walking around with her holding hands and the, and the sun shined on us. And I, and I thought to myself, I'm not guilty. I'm good. I'm love. And that was probably the most transformative moment of my life. Um, there were many, many other books that I will mention here that I'll probably talk about more. I've, I've, I mean, if you want if any of this information, I've written thousands of posts. I've written two books about this. Go to abscondo.com and you'll see everything about the spiritual teachings of love, unconditional love, truth, reality, honesty. Because without that, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody can get beyond age 40, certainly, certainly not beyond age 50 or 60 or 70, and be happy and be good. Because the ego... It's death. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it takes over your body. You think it's you. You think it's your, vo the voice in the head is you. No, it's your, it's your ego. The voice in the head is not you. The one, the you is the one observing the voice. The you is the, the being. And if you don't, you know, find God in whatever form, find consciousness, understand reality at a certain age, a person just becomes more and more miserable and bitter. And it would have happened to me. It was happening to me. But by age 40, at age 40, I had been saved. Now, that's probably offensive to anybody who's a Christian. I, 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 I love the message of Jesus. I believe fully in Jesus in, in terms of what he taught about love and forgiveness and unconditional love. The same stuff, right? That was the message. It doesn't have to just come from Jesus. It can come from Eckhart Tolle. It can come from, from Deepak Chopra and a lot of other flawed people. Wayne Dyer, 
the one book that that solidified my new spiritual awakening as my permanent state of being. It's called A Course in Miracles. For many years since that fateful meeting with that woman on the couch who told me to read Don Miguel Ruiz, for many, 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 many years, I had this material on, on loop. I mean, I would go to the gym and have and have A Course in Miracles playing on headphones or Eckhart Tolle. Another one is Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, A New Earth, and listen to his talks on YouTube. And what you will learn is to become a good person because you can forgive others. You know what love is. You know how to love. You're not desperately clinging to and manipulating other people to show you that feeling, to see that beautiful woman looking into your eyes and believing you're worthy of something because you already know from the moment you're born, you're already perfect. So this talk, I will end here. And my life tends to work, I guess, and at least since the year 2000, in a series of every five years, something fundamentally changes. And with this change, I quit the band. I was tired of bleeding money. I didn't have the money. I did not put any pressure on Susanna to spend time with me. I left it open. If she wanted to stay overnight or come to see me, she was always welcome and encouraged to come. I wanted I wanted to be with her at that point. I was madly in love with this woman. She, you know, we we had this egoless relationship, which I'll talk about in the next and maybe final talk. I don't know. For now. Um but the main thing is that, you know, you might think that I'm guilty from hearing all this, and I doubt that anybody actually has heard all this. But if you did, I'm sure you, your your ego and your and your, I'm sure it made it brought up a lot of ugly emotions and feelings. I understand it. What I'm saying to you is that I, I'm not guilty. That's not who I am. I am love. And I loved Eva the real Eva, the truth of Eva, the life within Eva, unconditionally. I love Ellie unconditionally, no matter what she does. I love Susanna. I love everyone unconditionally. I forgive, I apologize, I correct. Because ultimately we all have to be on the course of truth, honesty, acceptance, love. We have to create. We have to create value to earn our our living. We have to be generous and share with the ones we love. We have to work. We have to be the best we can to, to raise the, 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 the positive vibes and, and, and make the world a better place despite all the ugliness. So that's the end of Talk 6 and we'll go to our, my next five-year segment. I guess there's two more. There's now, for some reason, my life does work in five-year segments and, and this is 2015 and now we go up through 2020 and then the last one will end on the, on the current side bench, which is about to, the world's about to change again as we go into 2025.